Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of Partners Outdoors, and happy Great Outdoors Month, as proclaimed by President Biden yesterday. I'm Phil Gracia, Chairman of the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable and President of the RV Dealers Association. Our members sell and service travel trailers and motorhomes all across the United States. For nearly 30 years, Partners Outdoors has brought together stakeholders from federal agencies, business, and the nonprofit sector to discuss the future of outdoor recreation. Representatives from public lands and water agencies, ORR members, and university partners are here this week to work on outdoor recreation's most important issues. To kick off today's session, we are extremely proud to welcome Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack. He was confirmed as secretary in February, returning to a role where he served for eight years under President Obama. As the country emerged from the recession, he fought to put Americans back to work by investing in rural infrastructure and renewable energy. Prior to his appointment, he served two terms as the governor of Iowa, served in the Iowa State Senate, and as the mayor of Mount Pleasant, Iowa. Between 2009 and 2016, USDA, USDA enrolled a record number of acres in conservation programs through a new model of stewardship that brought together local, national, public, and private partners. Working with the USDA Forest Service is a top priority for the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable. ORR led the effort to include the Forest Service in the Great American Outdoors Act, which as we heard about yesterday, is already providing the means to modernize infrastructure across the agency. ORR has been in constant dialogue with the Forest Service around how these funds are allocated and how to ensure they do the greatest amount of good. ORR also partnered with the, VA, uh, the VF Foundation to provide public-private dollars to five communities selected by the Forest Service, EPA, and the Northern Border Regional Commission to help build their economies around their recreation. We look forward to keeping the momentum going with our partners at the Forest Service and are pleased to have Secretary Vilsack with us here today. Welcome to Partners Outdoors, Mr. Secretary. Well, Phil, thank you very, very much for that kind introduction and thanks for the opportunity to reconnect uh, with the Outdoors Partners, uh, Partners Outdoors and your efforts at uh, the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable. Uh, excited to be here, wish we could be in person, wish you could be at the USDA facility as you normally would be uh, at this time of year. Uh, but this is certainly an important opportunity for us to, to reconnect and also wanna recognize the importance of the mission that you all are engaged in which is really connecting uh, people, uh, connecting Americans to our incredible natural resources. Uh, we at USDA uh, look forward to working with you. And I know that you're gonna hear from Chief Christensen in just a few minutes, who's uh, helping to lead our forest service uh, into the 21st century. And we wanna work with you, uh, obviously to create a 21st century recreational opportunity in America. Uh, that means focusing on workforce, uh, focusing on technology, focusing on the right policy and making sure that we have the right management practices in place. Let me give you a couple of examples of things we're working on uh, in those four areas before I talk a little bit more about the importance of outdoor recreation. You know, we're very pleased and proud of the work that we've done uh, in developing the 21st Century Conservation, Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, these are over 10,000 individuals who help to expand our workforce during the year uh, that allow us to do more work in terms of preserving our force and our, our natural resources. Uh, we think this helps to build uh, the capacity, that workforce that you all will need uh, to expand recreational opportunities in the future. And we look forward uh, with the president's budget proposing uh, the, the establishment of a civilian climate corps uh, to expand on that important work. Uh, obviously, we're going to be focused on uh, developing strategies for adaptation and, and uh, mitigation of the impacts and effects of climate on uh, the outdoors and the Civilian Conservation Corps combined with the Civilian Climate Corps will give us an opportunity to expand significantly the workforce that understands and appreciates the role uh, that outdoor recreation and outdoors uh, play uh, in a healthy country. You know, technology, I was recently in a, uh, uh, in a forest in Colorado talking about the fire season, uh, which now has become really the fire year. Uh, obviously, we are deeply concerned about uh, the impact that these forest fires have uh, on, on recreational opportunities and the safety of those who are engaged and involved 
uh, in, in recreational activities that at any point in time, obviously, uh, there are challenges with reference to, to forest fires. Uh, the use of drones uh, creates the opportunity for us uh, to really do an even better job of fighting these fires, containing these fires, and making sure that people are, are safe, uh, preserving property and people uh, during the course of these fires. So you're going to see expanded use of technology as well in connection with our uh, efforts to protect the great outdoors. Uh, you know, on policy, uh, we're proud of, of the recently announced 30 by 30 program, Keep America Beautiful, uh, an opportunity for us to focus on voluntary conservation practices, a bottom-up approach, not a top-down approach, uh, focused on locally-led conservation efforts, uh, respecting private property rights, uh, looking at ways in which we can improve soil health, uh, uh, water quality, uh, habitat, all of which obviously impacts and affects uh, the capacity to expand significant outdoor recreational opportunities. Uh, we recently led this effort uh, with an expansion of our conservation reserve program, uh, creating another 4 million acre capacity in that program, which we think will result obviously uh, in improved hunting and fishing, and biking, and hiking opportunities uh, throughout the, uh, the United States. And we're looking forward to continued uh, expansion of, of efforts in this area uh, to promote uh, public land conservation uh, and preservation. Uh, on the management side, uh, we're excited about the opportunities that the American Jobs Plan uh, and the president's uh, fiscal year 22 budget provide. In both of those categories, the president understands and appreciates that the notion of infrastructure isn't limited to gray infrastructure, but in fact includes green infrastructure, the importance and necessity of investing in forest re restoration and resiliency, uh, developing new and innovative wood products that help allow us uh, to do more management activities in the forest, uh, seeing significant resources committed to and with the American Jobs Plan over a long period of time uh, to proper forest management uh, will no doubt improve uh, recreational opportunities in our forests. It also helped to create jobs. Uh, and oftentimes, I think there is a tendency on the part of many folks to not fully appreciate and understand the impact and effect uh, of our natural resources and the job opportunities that are created in rural areas as a result. You know, there's several reasons why uh, this roundtable, this discussion, this partnership are important. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, recognizing the role uh, of recreation. Uh, it is an economic driver. Uh, nearly $460 billion contribution to the gross domestic product. That's nearly 2% uh, of the total activity, economic activity in the United States connected uh, to the industry represented uh, here today at this roundtable. Uh, that is a significant number and impacts and affects millions of jobs. So millions of Americans not only have the opportunity to enjoy the great outdoors, but are also employed as a result of what you all do in creating access to the great outdoors. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, America's natural resources include many of the iconic landscapes that are so important to preserve and protect, uh, where uh, during this summer we'll obviously see a, a tremendous uh, influx uh, of visitors to these iconic landscapes. Uh, that uh, obviously generates tourism uh, and tourism dollars are dollars that roll around in an economy, a local economy, perhaps more quickly than just about any other uh, economic driver. Uh, you know, when we give uh, an opportunity for people to share experiences in the great outdoors, uh, we also create memories. Uh, we create uh, the opportunity for traditions to be passed on, uh, to, for values to be discussed uh, and, to, and to be learned. Uh, I remember uh, very specifically the opportunity to hunt with my sons uh, and my father-in-law uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Iowa, uh, an opportunity to share uh, experiences uh, while my uh, father-in-law was growing up and while I was growing up uh, with our hunting experiences, uh, a chance to pass those traditions, those values, if you will, on to the next generation. Incredibly important, I think, to the in total value system of this country. Uh, so those shared experiences and memories, uh, again, directly connected to the work that you all do. Uh, and frankly, uh, I've been watching recently uh, our, our grandchildren grow up, um, and they have had exposure and interest in the great outdoors, uh, particularly my grandkids who live in Colorado. Um, it develops a curiosity about the world around them. So it's a learning experience. Uh, it's a way in which we can encourage uh, the next generation of those who will protect and preserve our, our natural resources. And obviously there are significant health benefits. Uh, we need our uh, young people in particular to be more active, uh, to be more physically engaged and uh, the ability to provide access uh, uh, to the great outdoors creates an opportunity for them to be more physically fit. 
Uh, and this isn't just about physical uh, health, it's also about mental health. I think we learned that uh, during the recent pandemic. Um, I think uh, there was a great outlet uh, and that was the outdoors. Uh, we knew that we could be uh, socially distanced, we could be safely outdoors. And we saw many, many Americans become reacquainted uh, with the importance of physical activity, uh, with appreciating uh, uh, the outdoors. Uh, we saw this in the Forest Service. Um, 168 million visitors uh, to, the, to the national forest and grassland areas. That was 18 million people more than we experienced in uh, 2019. Many of them were first time visitors. Uh, and we expect and anticipate that those folks will be coming back year after year after year. Uh, and with your help, uh, we were able to keep nearly 80% of the sites that they were able to visit open uh, and functioning. Uh, this is an extraordinary effort uh, by the folks connected with the Forest Service and by this outdoor uh, recreation industry uh, to be able to make sure that you know, people that needed the outdoors in order to maintain uh, their physical and mental health uh, had access uh, uh, to the great outdoors. We're excited uh, about the work that we are doing with the Great American Outdoors. We certainly appreciate the work that you all did in making sure that the Forest Service was an integral part of that effort. Uh, we recently announced about 450 projects uh, that will allow us to improve uh, the experience that people have in our forests, and we're excited about the opportunity to, uh, to, to see more of that happen. Um, as we restore more, as we manage our forests uh, smartly, as we deal with uh, climate smart agriculture uh, practices on the land and private lands, we're going to see a rather rapid expansion, I think, of opportunity in this space, and you all are going to be incredibly important uh, partners in that effort. Uh, we're going to work together uh, to continue to improve access. Uh, we have a number of programs that you all help to create, you all help to promote the funding for, whether it's the Forest Legacy Program or America the Beautiful Initiative or, or the support for a fully funded land and water conservation fund. All of that incredibly important uh, to our ability uh, at USDA through the Forest Service and through NRCS uh, to do an, a, a job of improving the basic outdoor infrastructure uh, that is so vital to your industry, but so vital to the country. Uh, we look forward uh, with the Great American Outdoors uh, to a cumulative effort on the part of our, uh, the USDA and DOI and, and other uh, federal agencies of, of investing billions of dollars in expanded opportunity. And we're looking forward to uh, the opportunity to, uh, to see rural communities flourish as a result of this investment uh, in outdoor recreation, in tourism, uh, in creating new opportunities and expanded opportunities for people to benefit from the great outdoors. You know, one of the challenges we face, and this is a very important issue, is making sure that all Americans have access uh, to the great outdoors. Uh, I think it's important uh, that we understand and appreciate that many Americans, particularly uh, Americans of color, have not necessarily felt welcome, have not necessarily felt the opportunity to participate fully and completely uh, in what our uh, great outdoors uh, provides. Uh, and that's why it's important for uh, the work that you're doing uh, for the recreation economy for rural communities, which was uh, uh, alluded to by Phil earlier in his introduction and uh, that you heard more about, creating that gateway, uh, that pathway, if you will, from urban centers and ex-urban centers into rural areas, uh, creating opportunities for people uh, particularly people of color, particularly young people, uh, to have the opportunity to experience uh, that first hike, to, to learn uh, uh, how to fish and catch that first fish, uh, to have a hunting experience, uh, to have biking experiences, to have uh, uh, opportunities to really fully appreciate uh, the, the, the multitude of ways in which the great outdoors can be uh, appreciated, uh, utilized, uh, and, and, and have fun in. Um, and it carry with it, obviously, a, a lifetime commitment uh, uh, to participating and to being involved in, in, in outdoor activities. So I just wanted to take this opportunity uh, for a few minutes to, to express the importance of the work that you all are doing, uh, the tremendous support that you've provided to USDA and to other federal agencies that have allowed us now to receive uh, a guaranteed source of resources uh, through the uh, fully funded Land and Water Conservation Fund allowing us to begin to make these necessary investments uh, to address the backlog of maintenance programs that we know and you know uh, exist in the great outdoors, uh, to expand and improve the quality uh, of the opportunities that exist uh, to participate and to enjoy the great outdoors, uh, to make sure that we are making them available to 
all Americans uh, as we see increased use and to continue to invest, to continue to understand the importance and significance uh, of the green infrastructure that this country has uh, in terms of its values, in terms of its physical and mental health, in terms of its economic prosperity. Uh, so I uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to be engaged uh, briefly in this roundtable. I know you're going to hear a lot from the chief, uh, and I know that she'll have uh, a lot of wisdom to impart uh, by virtue of her in incredible experience uh, and leadership of the Forest Service. Uh, we certainly hope and wish for a safe recreational uh, season uh, as we begin the summer months and as be people begin to travel and uh, feel a, a, a bit of a freedom uh, that we haven't experienced for a while because of the pandemic. I uh, sincerely hope that all of you and those that you care deeply about continue to be safe and well, uh, and that all of us have the opportunity uh, in the very near future to appreciate and enjoy uh, the great American outdoors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I couldn't agree more <laughs> with your, your, your great words, and it's so clear that you have this tremendous and deep understanding of the community and our work and the contribution for the outdoor recreation economy. So thank you so much for all of your leadership. We were making great progress. Uh, we did when you were in that role uh, uh, during the Obama administration. We're, we're thrilled that you are in the role again here during uh, President Biden's tenure. Well, look forward to seeing you all outside. Thank you. So my name uh, is, is Frank Hugelmeyer, and I'm the president of uh, the National Marine Manufacturers Association. I'm also the vice chair of the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable. And uh, I'm pretty inspired by what I just heard from uh, Secretary Vilsack, uh, but we, uh, and he talked a lot about both the outdoor recreation economy and the impact on the green economy, but we're gonna shift a little bit to the, uh, the blue portion of the economy here with our next speaker. Um, and I think it's important for everyone to recognize that during COVID, um, outdoor recreation outpaced the growth of the U.S. GDP before COVID, and we certainly played a critical role in holding up the economy and the health and wellness of the American people post-COVID. Uh, and one of the key sectors, uh, recreational fishing and boating, um, which is the largest single segment of the outdoor recreation economy um, saw double-digit growth and, and uh, continues that continues today. That drove a lot of funding into uh, fish and wildlife programs, conservation uh, programs, as we know, gas taxes, excise taxes um, uh, from both recreational fishermen as well as boaters um, drives a lot of this funding. And, um, and so I couldn't be more pleased to be introducing our next speaker. It's my pleasure to welcome Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fish and Wildlife and Parks at the U.S. Department of Interior, Shannon Estenez to Partners Outdoors. Most recently, Ms. Estenez was the Chief Operating Officer at the Everglades Foundation, some, a, a group that's uh, close to my heart. Uh, previously, she served as the Department of Interior's Director of Everglades Restoration Initiatives and Executive Director of the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force. Her 24-year career in conservation includes roles with the World Wildlife Fund and the National Parks Conservation Association. And she's seen appointments by three Florida governors, including to the Governing Board of South Florida Water, Water Management District. She's a fifth generation native of Key West, Florida, one of my favorite places to fish on the planet and holds degrees in international affairs and civil engineering from Florida State University. Please join me in welcoming Shannon Estenez. Thank you so much, President Hugo Meyer. I thank you for the warm welcome, the kind introduction. Um, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to, to spend a little bit of time with everyone this morning uh, on behalf of Secretary Deb Holland, who I know would have uh, loved to join us uh, in this conversation if she had been able to. It's such an honor to uh, be speaking uh, following Secretary Vilsack, as well as the other incredibly distinguished speakers that are participating in this event this week. Uh, I am joining uh, the conversation this morning from South Florida, which of course are the ancestral homelands of the Miccosukee and Seminole people. 
Uh, I am currently, yes, serving as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fish and Wildlife and Parks in the Department of the Interior. Uh, in that role, I oversee the National Park Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, the majority of my work experience prior to joining the uh, administration was focused on restoring America's Everglades. And as Frank mentioned, I am a native Floridian. My family has been here for five generations. Um, and as a native Floridian, I, I appreciate the tremendous contribution that the outdoor recreation industry makes to local, regional, state economies. Uh, and as someone who has dedicated her career to conservation, I also um, appreciate and deeply understand the critical role that this industry plays in connecting people with our nation's natural and cultural heritage. You know, I was with my family in Key West this weekend. My nephew graduated from high school and we spent we spent a uh, Sunday evening out on the boat and uh, drove up, sort of got close to the beach. And the kids jumped in the water and, and there were just families all over the beach. And it was, it was just wonderful to see um, folks spending that time outside together. Uh, and uh, you would never have known from that uh, view that, that we had been, the country had been through what it's been through um, during this pandemic. So I feel very fortunate um, to have been raised in, in a family that spent a lot of time on the water and, um, and my uh, you know, children certainly have benefited from that legacy as well. And, and I, I want it for all children. I want, I want that access and that awareness um, of what nature, uh, the oceans, our lakes and rivers and lands um, can bring to our lives. So the president's you know, overarching mandate for the administration, of course, is to address the four overlapping challenges of COVID-19, economic recovery, racial equity, and of course, climate change. And the Department of the Interior uh, and its bureaus will play a central role in, of course, always how the United States stewards its public lands, conserves its wildlife, um, ensures appropriate environmental protections, pursues environmental justice, uh, and of course, honors our nation-to-nation -nation relationship with tribes. So as such, we're going to be playing a crucial role in tackling many of the challenges that are facing us as a nation, as well as seizing uh, the many opportunities that are before us that Secretary Vilsack particularly discussed um, with respect to the Great American Outdoors Act. You know, we have no time to waste really in taking action to protect public lands uh, and the environment and to offer um, you know, a bright future for um, Americans and so, this sense of urgency is certainly reflected in the administration's FY22 budget request, which was just released, of course, last week, and which proposes really historic investments that are gonna help our nation build back better and lay the foundation for you know, shared growth and prosperity really for de decades to come. The Department of the Interior's budget proposal totals uh, six, $17.6 .6 billion, which is a 17% increase over last year's enacted levels. And uh, the president's budget is gonna help the department address the climate crisis, conserve, restore, and connect people to our wildlife lands and waters and uh, support communities all over the country. I wanna focus a little bit on the National Park Service and of course the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and let you know that the total budget request for the US Fish and Wildlife Service is 3.6 billion dollars, which includes 1.9 billion to fund the Bureau's principal resource management and conservation programs. That discretionary portion of our budget request is the largest proposed increase in the services history. And I'm so proud and excited about that. Uh, the budget request also prioritizes funding for the operations and maintenance needs of the National Wildlife Refuge System with an increase of over $80 million in this area. You know, the refuge system comprising nearly 95 million acres, is our nation's premier network of lands and waters focused on the conservation management and restoration of fish, wildlife, and plant resources and the habitats that support them. And as this audience knows, the refuge system offers a broad range of outdoor recreation activities that depend on thriving fish and wildlife populations, including wildlife viewing, photography, boating, hunting, fishing, and of course, nature education programs um, for children millions of children of, of all ages. I know my children have, have benefited greatly from the refuge education programs here in Florida. Our national wildlife refuges are such a remarkable resource for our country. And I, I just wanna emphasize that because there is at least 
one refuge in every state and every territory. And there is one refuge within an hour's drive of most major cities in this country. And that accessibility made refuges an unexpected but welcome amenity during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, the refuge system hosted 61.4 million visits as people sought safe ways to recharge and connect to nature uh, closer to home during the pandemic. The refuge system is also an economic engine. It generates an estimated $3.2 billion annually for businesses and local communities. And of course, of course, we're also making significant investment in our national park system. So the FY22 budget request uh, for the National Park Services includes three and a half billion dollars to help modernize parks and park infrastructure, to invest in conservation efforts, to expand visitor access and to keep visitors safe. In 2019, 328 million park visitors spent an estimated $21 billion in local gateway regions while visiting National Park Service lands across the country. And that is a tremendous uh, figure. And we are headed into a summer which literally could be one of the biggest uh, visitation summers in the National Park Service's history as Americans and, and others revisit and rediscover our, our public lands following the pandemic. Now we at the Park Service and, Fish and the Department of the Interior, we know uh, the important role that our national park system plays in the tourism economy. And we also know, as many of you know, that our tourism policies are outdated. And so we look forward to working with the National Park System Advisory Board, the outdoor recreation industry and other partners to mod modernize that policy to enhance visitor experience and to better leverage the great economic potential of our national, our national park system. Secretary Vilsat touched on uh, the presidential priority of addressing racial equity. And, and within the Department of the Interior, a big part of our strategy is a renewed commitment to environmental justice and to addressing the disproportionate impacts on disadvantaged communities. You know, the administration is making strategic investments to improve and expand access for all Americans to public land. So for example, the budget request for the National Park Service includes an additional $20 million to expand access to the over 70 national park units that preserve and tell the story of historically underrepresented and marginalized communities and to support local and state efforts to preserve sites that document the struggle for equal opportunity. Within the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Urban Wildlife Conservation Program is focused on better serving folks in our urban communities who have historically been left out of discussions for, uh, about national, natural resources. Similarly, the National Park Service's uh, Parks and Community Assistance Programs are working with hundreds of communities across the country to create and enhance closer to home opportunities for everyone to enjoy the outdoors. And we look forward to collaborating with the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable, businesses, partners, and organizations who have worked to support efforts to make our national outdoor recreation legacy, inclusive, accessible, and welcoming to everyone. A few weeks ago, the National Climate Task Force released a report entitled Conserving and Restoring America the Beautiful. The report provides an overarching framework to implement the president's goal to conserve 30% of US lands and waters by 2030 to help address the climate crisis, to improve equitable access to the outdoors, and to strengthen the economy. The America the Beautiful framework recognizes and celebrates the voluntary conservation efforts of farmers, ranchers, and forest owners, the leadership of sovereign tribal nations in caring for lands, waters, and wildlife, the contributions and stewardship traditions of America's hunters, anglers, and fishing communities, and the vital importance of investing in playgrounds and trails and open space in park-deprived communities. The administration encourages all communities wishing to, wishing to to their lands and waters while boosting the economy and supporting jobs to participate in the America the Beautiful initiative. And to support this collaborative conservation initiative, we will prioritize supporting local partnership priorities, programs and priorities, improving targeted conservation efforts, restoring damaged lands, and promoting locally led efforts of all kinds, wherever communities wish to safeguard the lands and waters they know and love. Let me close by just saying again how honored I am to be here and to be part of this year's Partners Outdoors Conference. 
Secretary Holland and I greatly appreciate the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable making this event possible and inviting the Department of the Interior to participate. Speaking on behalf of, of all of us at the Department of the Interior, we are committed to working collaboratively in partnership to maximize the innumerable benefits that our public lands provide. When folks set out to visit a national park or a national wildlife refuge or any other public lands, their quality, the quality of their experience is, is enhanced by well-managed infrastructure and visitor amenities and by healthy ecosystems that support the wildlife they come to watch, to catch, or to hunt. Our country's natural heritage and public lands are a shared legacy and responsibility, and only through working together will we secure that legacy for current and future generations of Americans. Thank you so much. I too hope to see you outside soon. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you, Shannon. And I see we're, I see we're both fans of vinyl, actually. <laughs> I didn't know how to ac activate my background. So yes, you but all see cool. my own. Uh... I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank well, you. Thank you. Good. I'm glad to, glad to know another music fan. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's, it's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Angelou Ezilo. I use the pronoun she, her. And I'm actually zooming in today from the ancestral lands of the Muscogee tribes, also known as Atlanta, Georgia. So as a female CEO, I am very proud and honored to introduce Chief Vicki Christensen. Vicki Christensen serves as a chief of the US Department of Agriculture's Forest Service, leading a workforce of more than 25,000 permanent employees who sustainably manage 193 million acres of national forests and grasslands, support the world's largest forestry research organization and work with states, tribes, and others to sustain all of America's forests for the benefit of all citizens today and in the future. Under Vicki's leadership, the Forest Service cares for shared natural resources in ways that promote lasting economic, ecological, and social vitality for all communities nationwide. Her commitment to the core values of the Forest Service, conservation, service, interdependence, diversity and safety is evident in the priorities she sets for the agency, including controlling the COVID-19 pandemic, providing economic relief to communities, tackling climate change, advancing racial equity, and improving the Forest Service workforce and work environment. As chief, Vicki is leading agency efforts to tackle climate change and improve the conditions of America's forests and grasslands through shared stewardship with local, state, and national partners and tribes. Vicki's focus on investing in respectful relationships inside and outside the agency is reflected in the Forest Service's dedication to advancing racial equity in the communities we serve and to creating a safe and respectful workplace where we model integrity, protect one another, and learn from mistakes. Vicki joined the Forest Service in 2010 as a deputy director of fire and aviation management. Prior to serving as chief, she worked as deputy chief for state and private forestry overseeing forest service activities and managing wildland fire and working with our partners to sustain the health and productivity of non-federal forest lands. Prior to joining the forest service, she served as the Arizona State Forester and director of the Arizona Di Division of Forestry where she was responsible for the protection of 22 million acres of state and private lands in Arizona. She had previously served as the Washington State Forester, the culmination of a 26 year career with Washington State Department of Natural Resources. So without further ado, I pass the virtual mic to you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelou. It's just a, a thrill to be here. Um, I, 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 could, I could talk with all of you for a very long time about the importance of your work, our collective work, and of connecting all Americans to the outdoors. I'm going to focus more on our workforce to set up this, um, this great panel discussion ahead. Uh, you know, Secretary Vilsack and Principal Deputy uh, Assistant Secretary Esnos both said uh, very well, 
you know, outdoor recreation is so tremendously important for the American people for a variety of uh, reasons and services that flow from that recreation uh, opportunity. And the Forest Service, we take uh, responsibility for playing a huge, uh, a huge role in, in that effort, but we need all of you, all of us together to do that. And you know, if there was any doubt last uh, about the importance of recreation, re recreation to our public lands, last year's record visitation rates, you know, put an end to any of that doubt. And we expect those levels of visitation to continue this year. So it's a great, great opportunity. And of course, it does present us with some challenges. And as has already been stated, we, we need to up our game and we need to make our practices more contemporary. And uh, we need to step up the, the pace ourselves. Uh, that means in meeting the needs of the American people by building a 21st century outdoor recreation workforce uh, at USDA Forest Service. So I, I think most of you know at the Forest Service, we are stewards of some of the most incredible natural resources on earth and Department of Interior has uh, some of those incredible resources as, as well. The lands and the waters that are entrusted to our care are the birthright of every American. You know, they are the main way that Americans use and enjoy their national forests and grasslands. Recreation is also by far the largest source of jobs and economic stimulus from our national forest system. Why, it, it, you know, why is it, it, I think it's pretty easy to see. <laughs> we can all remember a favorite outdoor experience. Secretary Vilsack talked about it, maybe a special place for camping or hiking, fishing, skiing, boating, kayaking, uh, that first fish I caught or the first salmon we saw or the first bear or moose, you know, these memories, they last a lifetime. And we want those memories for people to take home from their national forest or any of their public lands to be a greater good of conservation for all of America. You know why? Well, we simply say it because our purpose at the Forest Service is to sustain nature to support life. You know, nature matters because nature provides and to make it last, we need to take care of nature together, not just the Forest Service and our partners, but all of us together, Americans from every background and every walk of life. We are all in this together, depending on nature to support life. So we need to engage all Americans in taking care of nature together. And that includes the 83% of Americans who live in metropolitan areas, including people who might not even know exactly where their drinking water comes from or where their food comes from where the materials for their homes come from, all of the resources they depend on for life come somewhere from nature. And our job is to help them connect to those resources. And there's no better way to connect Americans to the lands and waters they depend on than through outdoor recreation. So, you know, to say it, uh, it, it, to sum it up, our shared intention at the Forest Service is um, to create a culture of inclusion that awakens and strengthens all people's connection to the land. And we do that in multiple ways, but the way that resonates with most Americans is through outdoor recreation. You know, Here's, here's the direct way to say it. We live our core values of service and conservation by helping Americans connect to their natural resources through outdoor recreation. 
So we need a next generation workforce that is poised to help all Americans use and enjoy their public lands. All Americans, not just this group or that group, because we are all in this together. Interdependence, as Angelou said, is another core value for the Forest Service, and it extends to marginalized Americans, whether in rural communities, in tribal communities, or in urban communities far removed from public lands. You know, we have a special obligation to underserved, disadvantaged, and under-engaged communities because they often suffer disproportionately from lack of resources and from lack of opportunities to connect to the great outdoors. So that's why racial equity is a national priority for the Forest Service. We are incorporating equity into our program of work, into our daily activities, and into the values and benefits people get from their forests and grasslands, including opportunities for outdoor recreation and access. So our Forest Service social scientists are very engaged in this. Our, our scientists are conducting research on the various kinds of barriers and opportunities for accessing and using public lands and how they affect different groups differently. Latino groups, for example, or women of color. That kind of research can help us make our outdoor places safer and more inclusive for everyone. And I'm really deeply grateful for our incredible science and for their essential work. We also need a workforce that reflects the face of all of America, including our underserved, disadvantaged, and under-engaged communities. Diversity is another core value for the Forest Service. And we can help all people connect to nature if they see us living our core values of diversity, interdependence, service, conservation, and safety. And that includes being inclusive, modeling integrity, investing in, in our relationships, and treating everyone with the respect they deserve both in our workplaces and out in all communities. So all of this is part of building a 21st century outdoor recreation workforce. And we are here to learn about some of the concrete steps we might take to get there. At the Forest Service, we are already cultivating our future workforce and our next generation of outdoor stewards. We have special authorities that let us work with partners for workforce development programming and special hiring access to federal jobs. It's a great tool. And these partnerships give us the hiring pathways we need while also fostering diversity in outdoor employment. The secretary talked about it through programs like Job Corps and the 21st Century Conservation Corps. Our units across the country are offering jobs and training to young people and veterans, including people from various backgrounds and diverse communities. The Youth Conservation Corps and the Resource Assistance Programs let youth and young adults engage in outdoor recreation work. And special initiatives like the Youth Conservation Corps residential programs give young people from urban and tribal communities the opportunity to live and work on a forest, which in turn exposes them to recreational opportunities. And the new Climate Conservation Corps might very well do, uh, do that and more. And so our partners, all of you play a critical role in creating new hiring pathways for the Forest Service. A great example, just earlier this month, the Greening Youth Foundation and the Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards coordinated the bridge project which created opportunities 
for new and equitable hiring pathways for people of color and underrepresented communities. Over 50 organizations participated, including federal land management agencies, conservation nonprofits, and the outdoor industry. You know, the fact is many Forest Service leaders and employees got their start and chose their careers because of experiences with programs like these. We are already building on these programs to create the next generation workforce that we need and must have. You know, retention is just as important as hiring. And I will be the first to admit that we face retention challenges. Formal mentoring has to, to provide the right match and the right training and the right support. And none of that is easy, folks. And helping our staff embrace different cultures, different perspectives is always an ongoing challenge, but a terrific opportunity. And it is absolutely critical for our future success. You know, none of this is easy, I have to say, but we have to keep at it and we are committed to do so. Building a diverse, inclusive and resilient workforce, creating a work environment we can all be proud of where everyone is trusted with respect and valued for their work and has a sense of belonging, giving all Americans from every walk of life the ability to connect to nature through outdoor recreation. These things don't come lightly, they don't come quickly, or they don't come easily. It does take a concerted national effort at the highest levels, and it does have to be sustained over time. I'm proud to say that we have a national commitment, you heard it from Secretary Vilsack, at the highest levels of leadership, and you can count on us for sustained support. And at the Forest Service, we are building a diverse and resilient workforce and changing our culture by aligning our efforts with this is who we are, right here. Our agency core values, our code and commitments, and how we are experienced by our partners and the public. We are on a path to align who we really are with who we aspire to be, a values-based, purpose-driven, and relationship focused. So to sum it up, building a world-class inclusive workforce takes hard work every single day, but it's the only way that we can redeem our pledge to the American people to conserve the lands entrusted to our care. And we redeem our pledge and we fulfill our purpose by helping the people we serve connect to nature through memorable experiences in the great outdoors. That's why we're here today to plan for the workforce of the future together and our partners in outdoor recreation. Together, we have an opportunity to make the workforce investments we need to ensure a lasting legacy for our public lands for generations to come. And I thank you all for your tremendous commitment and your partnership now and in the future. Thank you very much.